So our next speaker, I'm hugely grateful to Kevin um, for stepping into the breach and uh, at short notice agreeing to be our speaker for this morning. Um, and, and we were really keen to um, pay attention to the life course in its entirety. And I think while today um, we are focusing on the health and well-being of adults and, and in some cases older adults, we wanted to acknowledge that obviously getting it right for children um, and, and supporting children to get the best possible start in life is absolutely vital. Um, most of the HPs in this room will know that we've already kicked off our work around uh, the transformational plan for children and young people and some of you <coughs> will be familiar um, with the, the work that's been done um, by the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists about the intergenerational spiral which is exactly what the Cabinet Secretary was uh, alluding to. Um, but Kevin has first hand experience of that and uh, he, he now works for an organisation called Aid and Abet, is that right? Um, but Kevin himself will, will tell you his story, a potted history of 21 years or so thereabouts <laughs> in 15 minutes. Um, Kevin over to you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Really nice to be here. Yeah, I have uh, 30 years and 50 minutes, so well done time. <laughs> you know, 30 years in the system, 30 years in the system, and you know, um, at the end, near the end of those 30 years, you know, I was broken, and busted, disgusted, and could never be trusted. I was mentally, physically and emotionally bankrupt. And I was hopeless and many times homeless. You know, and it all goes way back early when there was no intervention for me. You know. Four years old, Govan Glasgow watching a knife fight with my dad and two other men. Horrific scenes. Four years of age. Um, and when that event finished, nobody ever came up and says, How are you, Kevin? How are you feeling? What's going for you? Because at that time, it was absolute fear and terror. Absolute fear and terror in my life at that age. And nobody ever came up and says, How about you? At age of seven, I was then moved with my family, five brothers and three sisters, large family, from Glasgow. And we moved to West Lothian. And that move itself created more problems. New school, new community, new relationships. A young guy full of fear and anxiety and worry. And through that, you know what, I couldn't communicate mm -hmm. with people because nobody really came and says, how are you, Kev? How do you feel? Nobody explained about emotions and feelings. And so I always felt my own, even though I came from a large family. In fact, at times I never even felt part of the family. You know, I used to wonder if I was adopted, all that stuff. You know. At school, I was never involved in activity play. I never involved in a sports team, anything like that because I couldn't get involved, I was a shy guy, I was scared. And right into being the age of 13, through that school, running away from school, getting into trouble, you know, because I was full of fear and anxiety and couldn't really fit in. But at 13, all that fear was removed instantly. All that anxiety and worry was removed instantly. And I picked up alcohol and I thought, wow, this is good. I need to maintain that stuff. You know, by the age of 17, um, I'm drinking a lot, I'm drinking alcoholically at 17. I'm in a young offenders institution in Pullman at this stage. You know? When I'm in there, I'm back to being scared and worried and petrified and anxiety and worry because I don't have my solution. It takes away that fear and anxiety and worry. I'll never go back, you know, I'll never go back to prison. I'll never go back to the young offenders institution. I'll come back to any society and still need to say, how are you? How do you feel? You know, and you know, that was me for the next 20 odd years. You know, alcoholism <coughs> turned into drug addiction, crack cocaine, intravenous heroin addict, really in years there, in and out of prison. You know. And for all that time, I didn't have a purpose in life anymore. I didn't have a purpose in life. I only knew how to use drugs and get involved in crime. That's, that's all I knew. No purpose. And in 2006, mid-2006, my house is surrounded by armed police officers. You know, they've come for a gunfight. 
you know, because I've committed a crime with a gun. They've come to get me. And I'm making a choice. I'm thinking in here, you know, the opportunity to end it. And I'll let them end it. Because that's where my head is. That's where my thinking is. You know, because see, being that young at four, and all the way through, I slowly got conditioned by a belief system. And no positive role model in my life. You know. And through negotiators on the phone, they speak to me, to me and they ask me to come out of the house. Let's not exchange fire. And I walk out of the house and I'm following specific clear-cut directions because my life depends on it. And as I walk out and I'm looking at these armed officers, and they've got me standing like this, one step at a time. And I look across to this gunman, police officer, he's got the gun on me. And I glance down and I see the red dots here. And I think, this is for real. This is for real. That takes me into a long-term prison sentence in the system. In the system a long time. And then there they say, do you want to go for parole? Come out and get into parole, go to prison. Why? Why do I want to come out? Life's done. I'm in prison. I don't write letters because I've nobody to write to. I don't get visits because nobody's visiting me because I broke every relationship. Mum, dad, brother, sister, son, everybody said enough. And I'm in prison. And they say, do you want to move on? How do I do that? And they offer me CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy. Self-management recovery training, alcohol awareness, drug awareness, talk about my feelings, thoughts and behaviours, consequences, empathy. I say, I say to the prison officer, why now man? Why? Why now? Damage is done. The damage is done guys. You know, I'm in here and the damage is done, and you're asking me to change the neural pathways in my brain, in my frontal lobe, in my decision maker, to change my life. <laughs> you know, that's what I want to do now. Intervention when it's too late. You know, and I look at the guy, and I look at the, I look at the prison officers, and I say to them, you know, <coughs> this should have been done to me at ten. Thoughts, feelings, behaviours, consequences, actions. <coughs> Why wake him thirty-nine, and you ask me to change? This should be taken into schools now. This should be taken into schools now. And at that time I says to him, and I should take it into schools. I says to me, what makes you think it will work? What makes you think it will work? And I tell him the snowball story. You know, because when I was in first year at school, we brought a, a blind man to the school, he was collecting money for the blind we raised. And that man came into the school, his dog, and he sat on the stage and we gave him a check and people were asking him questions. I always remember that day. What time is it? Half past two. Half past two. I thought, wow. You know? Questions about his dog and what his dog does for him. One kid says, do you dream? Do you dream? He says, yeah, I dream. Yeah, I dream. People born blind don't get visual. They get hearing and sound or whatever. He says, but I get to see. It's the only time I see. It's when I sleep. He says, because I could see until I was 12. And one other kid asked, what happened to you? How were you blind? He says, I got hit in the head with a snowball, with a big stone in it, and it knocked my stone blind. I stopped flinging snowballs. Even to this day, when I pick up a snowball, I think of that way, man. So I'm saying, if I can go into schools and talk about thoughts, feelings, behaviours, and actions, and consequences, and talk about my life and what's been happening to me, it's not just a snowball we're talking about, it's life and death. Life and death. You know? And that prison officer looked at me and went, Kevin, you will never, you will never work in a school. You will never, you're a junkie. You're a heroin addict. You're an armed robber. You've caused many crimes. You will never, ever work in a school. I went back to my prison cell that night and, and I cried. And I cried. Not because of what he said, because I cried because I realised I had a purpose now. I had a purpose. You know, because I kept thinking about many kids who never had early intervention, who were living the same life as me. You know, it gave me a purpose. And I left prison. I left prison <coughs> and went into a, a drug rehab centre. And I got clean and sober. And through that process, I'd done a lot of work on myself. I'd done a lot of search holding and digging and finding and really what was going on in my life and I always went back to you. I was a kid. I 
have been prevented, 30 years in the system, could have been prevented. But at that time, where I was, growing up in the community, you know, alcoholism in my household, domestic violence, you know, there was many factors that played a part, you know. So after I came out of the rehab and done that searching and some sort of personal development on myself, <coughs> me and a couple of other guys with past convictions and addiction created the charity that I'm with today, Aid in a Bet. That charity, what we do is we go into prisons, we're all in Scotland supporting and helping prisoners when they come out of prison, pick them up at the gate in the morning of the release. We do because we care, we do because we care, you know. And, we, and it's broken adults, these guys are broken adults, just like I was broken, busted, disgusted and could never be trusted. And we get to build these guys. But like anything that's broken, when you build it back up, there's always cracks and weak points, you know. And that's how we are as aid in a bet. Then one day I get a phone call. Police. Last time I had a phone call for the police, we're talking about a house. We are police officers. Now it's the police talking to me, saying, can you come in and see us, Kevin? We hear what you're doing in Edinburgh and Lothian. Find it very interesting. Guy doesn't trust police officers or any form of authority at the time. And not to build relationships with them. And they're going to see these police officers, the VOW project, and they're going to see what they're doing. And the first time in my life I see cops with compassion. I see cops who care. Cops who are working with 20, 16 to 25 year olds, you know, preventing them becoming broken adults. And they ask me, do you want to be part of this? <coughs> Of course I do, man. Of course I do. I want to be part of this, man. Prevention. Better than cure. If I can prevent any of these young guys having that crazy <coughs> mind, wow, man. What an opportunity. What a gift. So, you know, working with these cops. Cops and cons. Cops and cons working together. You know, preventing 16 to 25 year olds from doing that life of the periphery, periphery uh, organised crime and drug addiction. You know, and you know, and looking back, right outside that house with cops and that cop standing with a gun on me, you know, I see his face every day. I see his face every day. No one here, no one here. In the office, I work with him today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the cop that was going to shoot me 11 years ago, he's my colleague, he's my partner, he's my friend today, you know. You know, I see him every day, you know. And you know, and, and this is where we are today, you know, because I didn't have a purpose. I never had a purpose, you know. And then through the VOW project and the police Scotland and people trusting me and I'm trusting the name and we're really working to really prevent young guys and girls going into the system and pulling them out of the system at that time. We get the Turn Your Life Around project. Turn Your Life Around project. You know, my life has turned right around full circle. And I get asked to get involved in a project called Turn Your Life Around. Guys, I'm working in schools today. I'm in schools. <laughs> you know, I get to work with primary school kids. Tomorrow I actually go speak to the parents because I leave them with the income. You know, we get to work with parents. But none of this would be possible. See, going back to that prison officer who says to me, Kevin, you will never, ever work in a school. He was right. Of course he's right. But only through partnership. Because when I go to the school, the police come with me. And the council come with me and we all go together. But these kids identify with me. You know? And their parents. You know? And it's about encouraging people to work with agencies. It's encouraging people to move on. You know, it's about letting people hold their dreams. Some of these kids have dreams. I didn't have a dream. I didn't have a purpose. But I found my purpose. It took the years in the criminal justice system, it took years in the system for me to find that purpose. You know, I don't stand here being big and smart today. You know, and let me tell you, no many guys get it to my level. The premature deaths that happen to young people in the system, premature deaths, you know, um, which never spoke about, you know. So for me, you know, I see a pattern working with these young kids, broken adults. Preventing young adults becoming broken adults and kids, and there's a pattern comes up. <laughs> See what happens at young ages? Kids suffer bereavement. Nobody talks about it. Things happen in their lives. Nobody talks about it. They're left to deal with themselves. And as they get older, it's all buried in here. And when it comes out, it comes out either through anger and aggression and violence because it's all kept in here. Loss of a parent, whether the mother walks out of the household or the father walks out of the household. 
you know, someone's died in the family. These are the patterns we see. The events of the communities, you know, these are the patterns I get to see. We're working with broken adults, <coughs> potentially young adults becoming broken adults and these kids, you know, and this is what we see is, you know, that sense of loss, that sense of emptiness. I spent many years feeling empty, many years feeling empty, you know. Um, my purpose today was to prevent any of these young kids. You know, my job today is to let them hold on to their dreams, let them hold on to their dreams and keep their dreams going. <coughs> they don't have my nightmare. That's what I do today. I'd like to thank the event, you know, for having us here, allowing us to come and speak. You know, um, I'm not a public speaker. I'm not a professional psychologist or a psychiatrist. I'm just an expert in my life. So I am an expert in my life. You know, I speak for the heart. I speak for the heart. <coughs> you know, my intentions is trying to get somebody's heart in here. And if I have, don't come and tell me. Tell somebody sitting next to you in case they didn't hear. You know, I thank you all for your time. I wish you all well and all what you do. I think it's a wonderful event and thanks for having me to speak. Thank you very much.